Energy Media readers, today we're going to be talking about natural gas, methane emissions, and natural gas as a part of the energy transition. And to help us understand how gas fits into the energy transition, we're going to be talking to Kate Height from Rocky Mountain Institute in Colorado. So welcome to the interview, Kate. Thanks, Markham. Thanks for inviting me. Now, why don't we start out by, uh, you've written a, a study, an insight. Uh, why don't you give us an overview of that? Sure. So we recently published an insight brief that we call a role of gas in the energy transition. Um, and it sort of lays out what RMI's perspective is on how gas is positioned to help us decarbonize the economy. Um, there is sort of a number of different narratives going up around there right now about sort of the, the length of time natural gas is going to be in the system and the different uses for it. And RMI, we really strongly believe that gas does have a role, but it's a very limited role for a limited period of time. Um, in the electricity sector, we are now able to substitute um, renewables and storage for the majority of energy generation in the US. Um, there are also opportunities to electrify buildings, so gas is no longer needed in buildings. But the area that we're not able to solve for yet that does demand a lot of gas is high heat input industries. Um, so thinking about how we can continue to deliver gas to those industries until substitutes like hydrogen are available and to really clean up that gas to make sure that on the upstream side of things, it is emitting as little methane as possible. Yeah, that's a big issue because the Alberta government, and of course, Alberta is Canada's Texas, um, Alberta government claims that its natural gas is very, very clean and that it will make, you know, green LNG, which is a great marketing slogan, but, uh, you know, not accurate. Uh, as it turns out, so Canadian Energy Research Institute did a study last year and found that because the, the wells are old, the gathering system is old, the facilities are old, they're leaky. And they probably have um, a leak rates well above 3%, which is the threshold for being equivalent to oil in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gas intensity. Uh, is that kind of what you see in, in uh, the United States as well? It really depends on the geography and the type of oil field you have, right? If you're take, getting gas out when you're associating with oil, that's a different situation than when you have a dry grass play. So it really very much depends. I think the situation that you're describing is the situation that we're seeing play out in the Permian Basin in Texas, where there are a lot of older assets. And you're right that over time, these assets um, deteriorate, um, but also they're not as productive. So they're producing less and they're emitting the same amount, right? So your numerator and your denominator mean that you're gonna by nature have a higher leak rate. Well, that's very interesting. So if, uh, if the gas is produced in association with oil, then that's more likely to be leaky? In general, when you're producing associated gas, you're going to have to engage in operations called liquids unloading, right, to, to separate out the different substances. And those processes often can emit a lot of methane. So we do find a tendency toward more leakage in those sorts of environments. Now, what about the uh, shale basins? North Dakota is, is infamous uh, for the amount of flaring it does. But are we seeing in like uh, Eagleford and the Barnett and the Permian, are, are we seeing a lot of venting and flaring? So the Permian is the largest flaring region in the entire world now, yes. Um, and a lot of the reason why these operators are flaring isn't because they want to waste their methane, it's they don't have a lot of takeaway capacity, right? Um, so there's a lot to do with economics here. Um, and we're seeing with the COVID-19 crisis, in addition to the price of gas dropping so rapidly, that it is no longer economic for many of these wells to run. Well, that's very interesting. But one uh, question I've always had about the Permian is uh, if it's associated gas, it seems to me that the rate of leaking is intermittent. You could have you know, a lower rate one day or even an hour, and then later on in the day you have a higher rate, and then a higher rate yet you know, later in the week or something. Is that an accurate take on that? Yeah, it really depends on what your production flow is and the practices that you're using. Um, I think that when we think about um, methane intensity of operations, we're really looking at an average over time. So there are th certain things that you're trying to solve for when you talk about methane leaks are, and leaks is sort of a broad category used to, to categorize all emissions, right? So you have process emissions that happen due to normal processes that you're undergoing. 
you have actual leaks, which are problems and sort of accidents, and then you have emissions associated with actual practices on the ground, like the liquids and loading that I, that I mentioned earlier. The thing that we're really trying to solve for the most in methane emissions leakage is those sort of medium-sized leaks that are leaking continuously that may be process-related or operations-related. But then also we're trying to solve for these big emissions events, um, sort of like we had in Aliso Canyon in California. And there's increasingly available um, cost-effective methane monitoring technology that's really enabling us to get a handle on how often these events are happening and enable us to take action and abate those leaks. Now, uh, I've interviewed a number of experts about the, the methane emission measuring equipment, and it's only lately that it's been getting uh, cheap enough and good enough to be, you know, to give us accurate data. Are you finding the same thing down in uh, the United States? That's right. I mean, I think that um, there's been just an incredible evolution in te methane detection technology over the past five years, right? And so the costs are indeed coming down. Um, we're not quite there yet with having technology that can not only detect leaks, but also detect methane intensity. Um, but we do have technology now that can give us those flags that we need to have to go in and take abatement action. I, uh, in 2015, I, I did a report on the, uh, uh, there was a, and actually a series of studies that came out of the Barnett Shale on uh, methane emission rates. And I remember the professor from the University of Texas, I believe it was, who said that 50% of those leaks, and it was a lot of leaks, came from super emitters. And so he said that would be like a facility with a broken valve, somebody left a, you know, a hatch open. And these were things that were easily enough fixed because they were repair and maintenance issues, but they weren't being done. What's your take on that? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I think this is where we have a real opportunity to leverage the, the increase in methane monitoring technology where we can put up sort of networks of sensors that can give us a picture of where these big events are happening so we can take rapid action. So let's back up for a little bit. We've determined that there are, there's a fair amount of leakage and uh, now it's being addressed and probably will be addressed in more seriously in the next uh, two to five years, let's say. Well, where does that then leave gas as a transition fuel? Mm -hmm. So I think the, the role that gas can play as a transition fuel, as I mentioned, is squarely sits in the industrial sector. So think steel making, glass making, cement manufacture, right? Um, and in addition, what we're working on in RMI right now is a standard that's going to enable us to differentiate gas according to the methane emissions that it has. Um, so we are going to be moving into a future where you have a standard, and if your leak rate is above, I don't know, let's say 0.25%, then you have a problem on your hands. Um, and this probably will be a voluntary initiative to start, um, just given the regulatory environment we have, at least in the U.S., but we're hoping that this sort of standard for performance can be embedded in regulation over time and really drive a race to the top for the best operators and enable those who are, who are running clean operations right now to be rewarded for that. Uh, last uh, question, Kate. I know that the Texas Railroad Commission is, is pro-oil, and I know that, you know, that the same is true of state regulators and other, you know, like North Dakota and Oklahoma. But surely now, with all of the emphasis put on climate risk, managing climate risk by the financial community, and the desperate need to get capital into those shale basin companies now, surely the industry is, and the regulators are, are serious about bringing the, the leak rates down. So the industry, 100%, very serious about it. They understand this is an existential threat to their business operations. Um, regulators are a little bit slower to move, um, right? I mean, there are a lot of entrenched interests, and sometimes they don't see the wider picture and understand the commercial considerations. In Texas in particular, a lot of these operators are looking to LNG as the next market, right? Um, and sounds like it's a similar situation in Alberta. And if that is going to be the thing, and Europe is going to be demanding more LNG, guess what? Europe has huge climate commitments that they're undertaking, so they're going to be demanding the best product possible. And the key to that is demonstrating transparency of your methane emissions. Second last, or the, the last last question. Okay. <laughs> so transparency, does that mean now then that we're going to have some kind of a, a regulatory regime where you have, you have to measure and you have to measure accurately, that data has to be available publicly and, they, and companies will be held to account if they don't make targets? Right, so in the US we already do have a regulatory regime that requires companies to report their methane emissions, the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program. Canada has a similar program. 
Um, however, we're now moving toward a future where facility level emissions reporting and national inventory estimates are no longer going to be the standard. We're moving toward a future where there are a number of different sensors deployed on drones, on cars, stationary sensors, we have flyovers happening, and we have more and more satellites coming online that are enabling us to granularly map the emissions information to specific assets. So an operator that is not focused on seriously addressing its methane emissions in the next five years is gonna have a huge risk of exposure and investors are going to um, take pick up on that risk for sure. Kate, thank you very much for this. And we'll be getting back to you, I'm sure, in coming months to have a talk about this again, because this seems to me as uh, climate risk escalates, this is gonna be one of the, uh, the uh, pinch points uh, around the debate on, on natural gas. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining.